good to see everyone out. We have several visitors. Always good to have visitors here with us. We've got a guest speaker today, Brother Travis Byers. He's joined with Brittany, and they are uh, expecting their first child in October. Travis is from the Union City, Tennessee area. From there, he went and uh, went to school at Memphis, the Memphis School of Preaching. Brittany is from Montgomery, and they are now, he is involved in his first work right now in Valdosta, Georgia. We're looking forward to what he has to say to us. Let's welcome Brother Travis. Good morning. It is a blessing and a privilege to be here with you this morning. Today our nation celebrates, or this weekend, our nation celebrates Memorial Day. It's a day that we set aside time to remember those that have gone before us, to remember those that have served. God found it also important for us to remember those who served Him. If you have your Bibles, and I pray that you do, if you would open to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. This is sometimes called the Hall of Faith. It's, it's people that God that were faithful to God, and so God wrote them down as examples to us. Hebrews chapter 11, and starting in verse 1, he says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, it's the evidence of things not seen. He says it's the substance. What, what does that mean, the, the substance? It's the assurance. We have assurance of the hope that's waiting us. See, faith is not some blind leap in the dark. It's not closing our eyes and just stepping off this stage. Faith is something that we have assurance of. We know that it's waiting for us. We are assured that it is there. We know there's something waiting for us when we pass from this life into the next. It is the evidence. That word means conviction. It is the conviction. We know. We know that we know that we know that God is there, that God is real, and that He is waiting on us when we pass from this life into the next to welcome us with open arms into his home. We go on down and he's going to begin to inform us about some of these people. In verse 4 we see, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained, uh, obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, by it he made, or by it he being dead yet speaketh. So here we have Cain and Abel going all the way back to Cain and Abel. And we see Cain and Abel coming before God and they both offer up sacrifices. Both are worshiping God. Both are trying to be, well, one is trying to be pleasing to God and one offers what he feels he should offer. And we see both people coming before God with a sacrifice and God says Cain's, or Cain's offering was unacceptable. But when it comes to Abel, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. He offered unto God something that God was well pleased with. What is faith? It's, it's total conviction. It's believing. It's having that hope that we know for a fact that God is real, that God is there, that He is the sustainer. He is the Alpha, the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the Almighty, the One that put everything in motion. It is believing. And not only is it just believing, our faith is something that requires action because Cain wasn't just accepted. Cain wasn't just pleasing to God because he believed that God was real. There was something Cain had to do, or Abel had to do. I kept saying Cain. There was something Abel had to do. Abel had to be pleasing to God. He had to follow the instructions that God had set before him. In verse 5 it says, By faith, notice those words. Those are going to be repeating throughout this entire chapter. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was found because God or was not found because God had translated him. Before his translation he had made this testimony. That he pleased God. Imagine God saying that of you. That he pleased God. That he was a faithful servant. He took his life. He took his faith, his belief in God. And he combined it with work. He combined it with things that he was willing to do. He was willing to submit himself. Willing to subject himself unto God and follow God. Willing to be a person who works. And then in verse 6, verse 6, but without faith, notice it now, but without faith it is impossible to please God. It's impossible if we don't have faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he what? Must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if we're going to come before God and we're going to be pleasing to God, God requires some things of us. He says, it is impossible to come before him if we do not have faith. If we do not believe that he is, 
it's impossible to be pleasing to Him. If we are not willing to subject ourselves, it is impossible. But we also must believe that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We talked about that a little bit in class today. But about God being a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. He's going to reward us. He's going to bless us. As we talked about it in the land of Israel, or in the land of Canaan. He said, I will bring you into a land. I'm going to bless you. God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. We have to believe that. We have to have the understanding that if I ask God for something, I have to really believe that He is there and He is really going to bless me. You look in James chapter 1, God says if you're double-minded, you're unstable in all your ways. Right? If you're asking for something but you really don't believe it, God said, let not that man think that he shall receive anything. He says, don't ask me if you don't believe I'm going to bless you. He says, I don't want you to be double-minded. We're going to be looking at a faith that works this morning. A faith that causes us to do something. A faith that causes us to be active in our service for the Lord. Verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as of yet, he moved with fear. He prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Noah. God tells Noah, he says, build an ark. He gives Noah the specifications, everything he needs to know about the ark. He says, build the ark according to this way. Now, Noah was not allowed to deviate. He couldn't turn to the left. He couldn't turn to the right. He couldn't change things as he saw fit. Noah couldn't just say, well, I don't like this wood. I think I'm going to go another way. I think I'm going to add an extra room for me over here to the side. He wasn't allowed to deviate from God's word. And just as Noah wasn't allowed to deviate in making the ark, we as Christians are not allowed to deviate from God's word today. We have to stay with His Word. We have to be willing to always follow God. God comes first before any preference we may have. But I want you to notice something else that it says. He prepared an ark, so he had his faith, his belief in God, his trust in God. God told him something to do. He was willing to do it. And then he put his faith into action and he built the ark. And then it says, by the which he condemned the world. What does that mean? What is it about His faith in action that condemned the world? When the world sees someone living a faithful life, when the world sees someone who is following God, who is living their life for God, that is a condemnation to them because they know they're not living that life. So by His faithfulness to God, we don't say things that they say. We don't do things that they do. We don't act in the ways that they act. We don't watch the things that they watch. We're set apart. We're different. We're sanctified, as he says. We're not like them. We're a peculiar people, a holy nation. We're set apart. We're different. And this is what he's talking about. Because he was faithful, because he did things God's way, he condemned the world. And at the same time, the world was being condemned because he was out there preaching and they were rejecting. At the same time, his faithfulness made him a what? An heir of righteousness, which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went. Husbands, imagine this for a moment. Wives, imagine yourself in the place of his wife. Imagine your husband comes home and says, Honey, we're leaving. He says, Okay, where are we going? Well, I don't know yet. Well, we're just going to pick up everything and we're going to go. Imagine what your response would be. Well, why are we just going somewhere? Well, God told me that we need to leave. We need to pick up everything we got and we need to go. And I don't know where we're going. We're going to be traveling for a while. I just don't know where. Do you think that required faith? That required a trust in God. That required something, a deep conviction, an understanding. God is real and I am going to follow Him no matter what it costs me. We see Abraham as we go on down as he's prepared to offer his only son. Do you think that might have been a hard command to follow? Offer your son upon the altar. And then he was called a friend of God. Why? Because he was willing to go through with it. He was giving, willing to give up something that was most precious to him. Could you imagine the command to offer your son? Can you imagine the willingness to be able to do that? Abraham was willing to give up everything that was most important to him in order to be pleasing to God. By faith, you see Isaac. By faith, you see Jacob. By faith, you see Joseph. 
And then we come down to verse 24 in Hebrews chapter 11. And we see, by faith, Moses. I love reading about Moses. I love studying about Moses. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Can you imagine being the grandson or the granddaughter of the Queen of England right now? Is there anything you would really want for in life? You're royalty. You've got access to any financial means you could probably want. You have access to go and do whatever it is. People are going to look up to you as a place of honor. This man is royalty. We're going to look up to him. He's in a position of power. He's in a position of authority. He's in a position where he can buy pretty much anything he wants. He has an entire army at his disposal to come to his defense. The city guards would have recognized who he was. No one would have messed with Moses growing up. No one would have bothered him. No one would have threatened him. He is royalty. But something comes along with that. Something comes along with being called the grandchild of Pharaoh. You had to worship the gods that the Egyptians worshipped. And along with that, you had to look at Pharaoh himself and say that Pharaoh was a god. Because to the Egyptians, the sun rose when Pharaoh awakened. And the sun set when Pharaoh went to sleep. Because he was the god. So Moses would have had to understand what they were teaching. He would have had to have partaken in part of their idolatry in order to even be pleasing to the Egyptians, to be pleasing to his grandfather. It says here that he was willing to give it all up. He was willing to suffer affliction with his people, to be brought down. What were the, what were the Hebrews at this time? What were the Hebrews doing? They were enslaved. They were having to work. They weren't getting paid very well. They were suffering. They were going through hardships. But it says he was willing to suffer affliction with the people of God and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There would have been many pleasures and many sinful things that would have come along with being the grandson of Pharaoh. There would have been many things that he would have partaken in. It says he was willing to give it all up. Willing to put all of that behind him to suffer afflictions with the people of God. Why is that? Notice in verse 26. He says, Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He was looking forward to something far greater than the riches of Egypt. He was looking for something far greater than all of the gold they could have built on top of all of those pyramids. He saw riches in heaven. What does God tell us? Lay, out, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, but treasures where? Treasures in heaven. That's what he's trying to get across. That's what he's trying to point out here. There is something greater in this life. You can take all of the gold and, and pile it up and, and, and all of the silver and all of the diamonds and all of the rubies and everything of value you can name and it will not equal the treasures of heaven. Because all of those things that you see, God created all of that. He is above all of that. He is worth more than that. By faith... Verse 27, He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, as seeing him who is invisible. King Pharaoh, willing to put children to death. A man willing to go to war, a strong, powerful individual, would lead his troops into battle. We're talking about a vicious king here. We're going to look at a different vicious king tonight. But we're here, we're looking at Pharaoh, a man sinister. He was willing to stand before this Pharaoh and go through these things, enduring the wrath. What was going to come upon them? When when Moses first stood in front of him and told him the, 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 the prophecies of God, how did Pharaoh react towards the Israelites? He increased their workload. He made it more difficult on them. He knew there were things coming that were going to be hard to bear. There was going to be difficulties and trials that were going to come along uh, along with following God. Verse 29, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying, were to, were to do, were drowned. 
So here you have them walking through the Red Sea. Do you think that took a conviction? At first you might say no. They saw the walls of water pile up and there were Egyptians coming behind them and that that was a danger so they ran across. But you have to think about what happened. Put yourself in the mind of one of those Hebrews that's about to cross the Red Sea. You look up on this side and there's water standing straight up. You look up on this side and there's water standing straight up. If that's not God, if you do not truly believe in God, at any moment those waters could come tumbling down. At any moment, that could be the end. You're not going to survive that. You had to have faith that caused them to act. God wasn't going to just scoop them up on this side and carry them over and set them down on the other side. They had to walk from this side to that side. They had to put their faith, their trust in motion. They had to be willing to work, willing to do something, willing to be pleasing to God. They were willing to go. That's the kind of faith we need, isn't it? A faith that causes us to work. A faith that motivates us. A faith that says we are willing to submit to God. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, He put Himself in the form of a what? Of a servant. He didn't come as a a conquering king, able to take anything He wanted at the moment's notice with a powerful army and all of the gold. He came as a servant. Willing to serve. Ready to put and show what faith looks like in action ready to show the world what it looks like whenever a servant is willing to work for his God. You see the same thing with the Apostle Paul. You see a man that allowed his faith to change him. You see, that's what our faith has to do. Our faith has to change us. Our faith has to cause us to work. It causes us to, to move in some way. You may say, well, what do you mean by that? Our faith has to take our life from one place to another. Look at Paul. Paul was a man who was a murderer. A man, who were putting Christ, a man who was putting Christians to death, God took this man because of his faith. Because he was willing to work. Because he was willing to put his faith into motion. And this man wrote. This man was a penman by which God wrote. He was able to change the life of Paul. Faith. Faith can change everything about your life. He was talking this morning about you. perhaps you see someone that maybe was once in drugs and now they're no longer in drugs. Why? Because there is something greater that they're looking for that they can't find in those drugs. There's something greater than alcohol. There's something greater than any addiction that someone can put in front of you. He's stronger. He's more powerful than that. But you have to be willing to let your faith be who you are. It has to be your conviction. It's everything about who you are. It's how you speak. It's how you talk. It's why you do the things you do. It's why you don't do certain things that you don't do. It becomes everything about you. It envelops you. But it's not just faith only. If you have your Bibles, let's turn over to the book of James. James chapter 2. Our faith has to be something that causes us to move. James chapter 2. In verse 14, he says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? He's asking a question here they understood the answer to already, and he's about to give an example. He's asking a question that they know the answer is no. His faith alone is not going to save him. He says, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, you give him not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? He says, Even if you have the faith to move mountains, but you're not willing to do anything, if you're not willing to love, if you're not willing to work, what does it profit? Verse 17, he says, Even so faith, if it has not works, I want you to underline that, It's dead, being alone. He says, if you have a faith, it doesn't work. It doesn't cause you to be motivated. It doesn't cause you to do. It doesn't cause you to act. That faith is dead. He says, yea, a man say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee by faith by my works. He says, thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. 
He said the devils understand that. The devils are willing to acknowledge there is a God. They understand there is a God. Satan himself acknowledges there is a God. And if you look in the book of Job, he had to come before God. He acknowledged there is a God. But there's something more required than just belief. There's something more required than just saying, I believe there is a God. He said, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is what? Dead. Faith without works is dead. He repeats it again. He wants us to have a clear understanding. There is no life in a faith that doesn't work. He says in verse 21, was Abraham our father not justified by work? Or was Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing that how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Underline that. How can we be pleasing to God? How can we have a faith that God calls perfect? It's when we take our trust, when we take our conviction, when we take our belief in God, and we combine and we combine it with the work that God has put before us, and we're active. God says, "That's perfect. That's what I designed. That's what I want you to do." And then, verse twenty-four of James chapter two, you see the only time faith only is mentioned in the Bible. He says, you see then how by works a man is justified and not by faith only. It requires us to do something. It requires us to be active in His kingdom. He tells the parable of the sower. A sower went forth to sow and he sows the seed upon the different soils. We talk about the different soils sometimes, but we can never forget we have to be the active sower. We have to be willing to go out there and sow that seed. Be willing to be active in His kingdom. Verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, even so faith without works is dead also. God wants us to be a people who have a conviction, not wavering, not double-minded, not unsure of whether He is really there or not. He wants us to be a people who are completely convicted who has assurance that there is a heaven, that there is a God in heaven, that we are going to spend eternity with Him. He wants us to be absolutely sure without question He is real. And then once we're sure, once we really believe, He wants us to work. He wants us to be active in His kingdom. He says when you do that, when you have your faith, and you combine it with active work in the kingdom, what did He say about Abraham? Perfect. He said, and because of Abraham's faith and because of him being willing to work, he was called a friend of God. Isn't that how you want to be remembered by God? Amen. He is my friend. He is well pleasing. That's how I want to be remembered by God. He is someone who worked, he believed, he trusted. Perhaps there's someone here that needs to submit themselves to God. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. If you would underline this or or highlight it, whatever it is that you do, never forget this verse. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are where? Notice it where you're located. To them which are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean to be be free from condemnation? There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means that the sin, the shackles, the chains of sin are gone. They're not bound on you. They're, They're not holding you back. Whatever was holding you back before you were a Christian... Those things are washed away. Those things are gone. You're a new creature. He said, put yourself to death. Mortify your members upon the earth. Did He not? He says, put that old man to death. And when you come up out of that water, that watery grave of baptism, Romans 6 and verse 3, He says, know you not that so many of us, notice it now, we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into His death. So when we come up out of that watery grave of baptism, the old man is gone. He's put to death. And we're a new creature. We're a new creature who has faith in God, who's willing to work in His kingdom. Perhaps there's someone here this morning that has never put their faith and put their trust in God. 
Perhaps there's someone here this morning who believes there is a God, who believes in God. But you need to repent. You need to, you need to do something different in your life. There was something that's, that's holding you back. He says repent. And then be willing to confess. He says in Romans 10 and verse 10, For with the mouth man confesses unto righteousness, but with the heart... what? Well, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we have to believe, we have to be willing to repent, and we have to confess. And then Peter in Acts 2.38 said, Repent and be baptized. The very first sermon that Peter ever preached, he said, Repent and be baptized. Perhaps there's someone here that's never been baptized into Christ. And you need to be willing to submit yourself to God. Be willing to do the things that He commanded us to do. Was Abraham justified? Was Abraham pleasing in God's sight before he left the land to go? No. Was Noah pleasing in God's sight if Noah had said, I'm not going to build the ark? No. Would Moses have been pleasing in God's sight if he says, I'm not going to walk across the Red Sea? No. We have to be willing to obey God. We have to be willing to submit to His command. Because His Word is perfect. His Word is complete. It has everything that we need, dividing even the soul and the spirit, the bone and the marrow. He has the ability to give us the perfect Word. Perhaps there's someone here who has become a Christian and they've been struggling in their conviction. Perhaps there's someone here this morning that has become a Christian and they've been struggling because they haven't been as active as they should. They've been struggling in their attendance. They've been struggling in in, in whatever that is. It said that Abraham was looking for a city. A city that had a foundation. A city whose builder and maker was God. What about the church? Who's the foundation? For no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is our foundation. Everything that we believe, everything that we do has to be built upon that truth. If Christ did not raise up from the dead, if He did not come out of the tomb on the third day, then everything we believe is in vain. He is the foundation of who we are. But He's also looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. What city is that? Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build My kingdom, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He built His church. He built His kingdom. And you can be a citizen in that kingdom. And every citizen in His kingdom has a role. Every citizen in His kingdom has a part. Some are preachers. Some are elders. Some are deacons. Some are song leaders. Some are really good at visiting. Some can write cards. Some can do... Everybody has a role to play. There's something for everyone to do. Won't you come? Won't you be part of His kingdom? And won't you be a faithful servant to God as we stand and as we sing? When we walk with the Lord and the Lord